Chapter 6 The Freedom Fighter After Captain Corelli had left, Pelagia did some household tasks, then went outside to brush her goat, thinking about the captain as she did so. Mandras caught her dreaming. He had climbed out of bed, cursing and completely cured on the day of the invasion, as if the arrival of the Italians was something so important that illness was a luxury to be left behind. He had gone down to the sea and swum as if he had never been away, and had returned with a smile on his face and a fish for Pelagia. But Pelagia only felt guilty now whenever she saw him, and deeply uncomfortable. She jumped when he tapped her on the shoulder, and despite her effort to force a bright smile, he did not fail to see the look of alarm in her eyes. He ignored it, but would remember it later. I'm going to join the freedom fighters, he said. I'm leaving tomorrow. Oh, said Pelagia. There was a long silence. Then she said, I won't be able to write. I know. Pelagia shook her head slowly and sighed. Promise me one thing. Whenever you are planning to do something terrible, think of me, and don't do it. I'm a Greek, he said gently, not a fascist, and I will think of you every minute. She heard the sincerity in his voice, and felt herself wanting to cry. They embraced, like brother and sister, not people who were engaged to be married. God go with you, said Pelagia and he smiled sadly. And with you. I shall always remember you swinging in the tree. They laughed. Then he looked at her lovingly for one last moment, took a few steps, paused, turned, and said softly, I shall always love you. Mandras joined a group of three men in the hills of the Peloponnesus in southern Greece. They had neither plan nor purpose. All they knew was that they were driven by something from the depths of the soul, something that commanded them to rid their land of strangers or die in the attempt. They set fire to lorries, and one of their number stabbed an enemy soldier, and afterwards sat shaking with fear and disgust while the others comforted and praised him. They lived on the edge of a forest in a cave, living off supplies brought by the priest of a neighboring village. There were several other groups of freedom fighters in the area, the most organized being a communist group known as Elas, although it did not declare itself as communist, preferring to disguise the fact. Mandras joined Elas at first because he had no choice. He and his companions were lying in a small leafy shelter that they had built, when they were suddenly surrounded by ten men with thick beards, pointing guns at them. Their leader, who wore a dirty red cap, said, Come out! And the men slowly stood up and came out, fearing for their lives, their hands upon the backs of their heads. Who are you with? demanded the man with the cap. With no one, replied Mandras, confused. The deal is that either you go back to your villages and leave us your weapons, said the leader commandingly, or you fight us and we kill you, or you join us under my command. This is my territory and no one else's. Which is it? We came to fight, explained Madras. Who are you? I am Hector, not my real name, and we are the local branch of Elas. Hector's men grinned in a very friendly fashion, and Mandras looked from one of his companions to the others. We stay? he asked, and they nodded. They had been too long in the hills to give up the fight, and it was good to have found a leader who might know what ought to be done. Good, said Hector. Come with us, and let's see what you are made of. He led Mandras and his companions three kilometers to a tiny house guarded by one of Hector's men. Bring him out, Hector said, 
and the man kicked and pushed a thin old man out into the sunlight, where he stood trembling and blinking. Hector handed Mandras a length of knotted rope, and, pointing to the old man, said, Beat him. Mandras stared at Hector in disbelief, and the latter stared fiercely back at him. If you want to be with us, you've got to learn to teach these people a lesson. This man has been found guilty. Now beat him. Mandras struck the man once with the rope, lightly, because of the man's age, and Hector impatiently exclaimed, Harder! Harder! What are you, a woman? Mandra struck the old man once more, a little harder. Again, commanded Hector. It was easier each time he hit him. In fact, it became a pleasure. It was as if all the anger from the earliest years of his childhood rose in him and was given expression. The old man threw himself to the ground, screaming, and Mandras suddenly knew he could be a god. Hector stepped forward, took the rope from his hand, and placed a gun in his grasp. Now kill him. Mandras knelt down and placed the gun against the old man's head, but he could not do it. He closed his eyes tight and told himself that he had to be a man in front of other men. Anyway, he was only doing what Hector had ordered him to do. The man was going to die anyway. Mandras tightened the muscles of his face and shot the man in the head. Afterwards, he looked not at the bloody mess of bone and brain, but in disbelief at the smoking gun. Hector patted Mandras on the back and said, Well done. Mandras tried to struggle to his feet, but could not do so, and Hector helped him up. Revolutionary justice, he said. Historical necessity. As they left the village, Mandras found that he could not look anyone in the face, and he stared down into the dirt. What did he do? he asked finally. He was a dirty old thief. He took a bottle of whiskey from supplies that were meant for us. You have to be tough with these people, or they start doing what they like. They're full of the wrong ideas, and it's just something we have to get out of them. During his time with Hector, Mandras learnt a great many things. Hector taught Mandras to read and write, and taught him all about communism. Mandras learnt that he was not a fisherman, but a worker and that he was as good as Dr. Iannis and deserved the same pay. He learned to take food and animals from hungry villagers without payment, since Elas was working so hard on behalf of the Greek people. When villagers attempted to resist them, then Hector and his men punished them, not just by shooting them, but by tearing out eyes and cutting mouths, so that people died smiling. Hector explained to Mandras that the villagers were fascists and loyal to the king, and that a good lesson would help them to change their ways. Mandras also learnt to rape women and to enjoy their screams, since it was all in a good cause. A new and better Greece would be built, and you did what you liked with the inferior bricks that were going to be thrown away anyway. It was like making an omelette and throwing away the eggshells, said Hector, and Mandras drank in every word his leader said. Chapter 7 A Problem with Eyes Pelagia treated the captain as badly as she could. If she served him food, she would deliberately spill it as she put it down, and eventually... She noticed that he had acquired the habit of not pulling in his chair until she had already put the food on the table. His failure to protest at her treatment of him and his constant politeness made her even more annoyed. Her anger was so deep and so bitter that she needed to shout at him or even strike him in order to release it. 
After two months of sleepless nights, months during which she had done her best to annoy him, the captain remained calm and friendly. One day, he left his gun on the table. After some thought, Pelagia decided to put the gun in a bowl of water for a few minutes, in the hope that this would do some damage. The captain came in and caught her just as she was lifting the gun out of the water. She heard a voice behind her and, in her fear, dropped it back in the bowl. Oh, God, she exclaimed, you frightened me. The captain looked down at the gun, raised his eyebrows and said coolly, I see you are trying to make trouble for me. This was not what she had expected, but nevertheless her heart beat faster with fear and anxiety. I was washing it, she said weakly at last. It was terribly oily. How charming to know so little about guns, said the captain. Pelagia went red, strangely angered by his suggestion, which she knew he did not mean that she was a sweet and silly girl who did stupid things. You are not a good liar, the captain added. What do you expect, she demanded, immediately wondering what she had meant. The captain seemed to know, however. It must be very difficult for you all to have to put up with us. He removed the gun from the bowl, sighed and said, I suppose you have done me a favor. It does need cleaning. Aren't you angry, then? Why aren't you angry? What's anger got to do with music? Do you really believe I've got nothing important to think about? Let's just think about important things and leave one another in peace. I'll leave you alone, and you can leave me alone. This idea struck Pelagia as new and unacceptable. She did not want to leave him alone. She wanted to shout at him and hit him. Suddenly, overcome with emotion, she struck him with all her force right across the left cheek. He tried to step back in time, but was too late. He steadied himself and touched a hand to his face, as if comforting himself, then held out the gun. Put it back in the water, he said. I might find it less painful. This remark made Pelagia even angrier. She rushed out into the yard and kicked an iron pot, injuring her toe, then threw the pot over the wall. The captain, watching her from the window, shook his head in amazement. These Greek girls, such passion and fire, he thought admiringly, and then wondered why no one had ever written an opera set in modern Greece. A tune entered his mind, and he began to sing it softly to himself, thinking that perhaps he would call it Pelagia's March. As the months went by, Pelagia noticed that she was losing her anger, and this puzzled and upset her. The fact was that the captain had become as much a part of the house as the goat or her own father, and she was quite used to seeing him playing with little Amoni in the yard, or seated at the table, deep in concentration, composing music for the mandolin. Early in the morning she looked forward with pleasure to the moment when he would enter the kitchen and say, Calimera, Kiria Pelagia, is Carlo here yet? and in the evening she would actually begin to worry if he were a little late. A new source of anger developed, the problem being that this time the anger was directed against herself. It seemed that she just could not help looking at him, and he was always catching her. There was something about him, sitting at the table as he went through his paperwork, that made her look up at him regularly. But every time she looked up, he did too, and she would be caught in his steady gaze, as surely as if he had grasped her by the wrists. For a few seconds they would look at one another, and then she would grow red and look down. 
Then, a few seconds later, she would look up, and at that moment he would return her glance. It was impossible and embarrassing. I've got to stop doing this, she would tell herself, and, certain that he was deep in his tasks, would look up and get caught again. She knew he was playing a game with her, that she was being played with so gently that it was impossible to protest. After all, she had never caught him looking at her, so it was all her fault, obviously. Nevertheless, it was a game of which he was in absolute command, and in that sense she was its victim. She decided that she would not be the one to look down. She would wait until he broke away. She searched for every last bit of courage and looked up. They looked at one another for what seemed like hours, and Pelagia wondered foolishly if it was considered acceptable to blink. Her eyes began to water, and she started seeing two captains instead of one. He did not look away, but began to make funny faces, showing his teeth like a horse, and moving the tip of his nose from side to side, so that Pelagia began a smile, then laughed aloud and blinked. Corelli jumped to his feet, crying, I won! I won! And the doctor looked up from his book, exclaiming, What? What? You cheated! protested Pelagia, laughing. The doctor looked from the captain to his daughter, adjusted his glasses, and sighed. Whatever next, he demanded, knowing perfectly well what was next, and working out in advance how to deal with it. Some days later they passed each other at the door, she going out and he returning from work. Unselfconsciously, she raised one hand to his left cheek and, in passing, kissed him on the other. He was astonished, and by the time she reached the entrance to the yard, so was she, because it was not until then that she realized what she had done. She stopped as if she had walked straight into a wall, felt her blood rising to the roots of her hair, and realized that she did not dare look back at him. He called out as she knew he would. Kiria Pelagia! What? she demanded. What's for dinner? Don't laugh at me. I thought you were my father. I always kiss him like that when he comes in. Very understandable. We are both old and small. If you are going to laugh at me, I shall never speak to you again. He came out and threw himself upon his knees before her. Oh no, he cried, not that. Shoot me, beat me, but don't say you'll never speak to me. He grasped her around the knees and pretended to weep. The whole village is looking, she protested. Stop it at once. My heart is broken, he cried, and taking her hand, he began to cover it with kisses. Stupid goat, you are insane. Corelli laughed and got to his feet. Come inside, he said. I've got something very interesting to show you. Relieved by this sudden change of subject, she followed him through the door, but found that he was passing her on the way out again. He put his hands on each side of her head, kissed her dramatically on the forehead, exclaimed, I'm sorry, I thought it was the doctor, and then ran away across the yard and down the street. She stared after him in amazement, making every effort not to laugh or smile. Chapter 8 Snails When the doctor glanced out of the window, and saw Captain Corelli creeping up behind Limoni in order to surprise her, he laid down his pen and went out into the afternoon sunlight. Excuse me, children, said the doctor, ignoring the captain's embarrassment. Limoni, 
Do you remember that you told me you know a place where there were lots of snails? Can you come round this evening and show me where they are? Limoni nodded importantly. What's all this about? asked the captain. Stiffly, the doctor said, Thanks to you Italians, there's almost no food. We're going out this evening to find snails. The captain wiped the sweat from his forehead and said, Permit me to come and help. So in the evening, an hour before sunset, Pelagia and her father, Limoni, and the captain climbed over a low wall and then began crawling through impossibly thick undergrowth in their search for snails. It became immediately apparent that there were quantities of snails everywhere they looked. The child and three adults became so involved in their task that they did not notice they had become separated. The captain found himself on his own and paused for a second, realizing that he could not remember ever having felt so content. Oh, oh no, came Pelagia's voice from nearby. Fearing that perhaps she had been hurt, the captain crawled towards the place where her voice had come from and found her unable to move, her hair caught in some briars, her neck pulled backwards. Don't laugh, she said crossly. I'm not laughing, he said, laughing. I was afraid you were hurt. If you don't help me, I'll murder you. Just stop laughing. Hold still, he told her and reaching over her shoulders, he began to pull the hair out piece by piece, as gently as he could. I've done it, he said, pleased with himself, and as he drew back and his lips passed her cheek, he kissed it tenderly before the ear. She touched her fingertips to the place of the kiss and said, shaking her head at him, You shouldn't have done that. He knelt back, and held her gaze with his own. I couldn't help it. I'm sorry. They looked at one another for a long moment, and then Pelagia began to cry. What's the matter? asked Corelli, frowning in concern, as Pelagia's tears rolled down her cheeks and fell into the bucket among the snails. You're drowning them, he said, pointing. What's the matter? She gave a sad smile and started crying again. He took her in his arms and patted her back. Suddenly she said, I can't stand it any more, not any of it. I'm sorry. Everything is horrible, agreed the captain, wondering if he too might start to cry. He took her head gently in his hands and touched the tears with his lips. She gazed at him wonderingly, and suddenly they found themselves underneath the briars in the sunset, surrounded by escaping snails, deep in their first secret, guilty kiss. Hungry and desperate, filled with light, they could not move away from each other, and when finally they returned home, they brought back fewer snails together than Limoni brought on her own. They became lovers in the old-fashioned sense. Their idea of making love was to kiss in the dark under the trees or sit on a rock watching the sea. He loved her too much to risk her unhappiness, and she had too much sense to take risks. Again and again she had seen the tragedy of girls with an unwanted child and the poisoned deaths of girls who had tried to end their pregnancies. It was hard for Pelagia to love an invader, and sometimes she shouted at Corelli, her eyes filled with tears of anger. How can you bear to be here? Orders, orders from a madman. Don't you know you're being used? Why don't you take your guns and leave? Don't you know who the enemy is? At these times, the captain listened silently and bowed his head, 
the bitterness of his shame eating like a worm at the muscles of his heart. But they could not stop themselves from loving one another. Gunther Weber managed to obtain a motorcycle for the captain, who turned up outside the doctor's house one day, wearing a cap and goggles. Do you want to come for a ride? he asked. Pelagia crossed her arms. I've never been on one. In fact, I've never been in a car either, and I'm not starting now. I've never been on one either, he said, but it's very easy. Somebody might see us, said Pelagia. The captain solved this problem by bringing Pelagia a disguise consisting of a cap, goggles, and a long leather coat, and the next day they met around the bend of the road and rode off on the bike. They fell off twice, without injury, and she gripped his waist, white-faced with terror. She climbed off, shaking, and realized she could not wait to get back on. It was splendid to ride a motorcycle. They went to places where Pelagia could not have been recognized and to places that were deserted, and there she would put her arm through his and walk beside him, leaning her weight against his shoulder, always laughing. With him, she would always remember that she laughed. One day they discovered a ruined hut, so old that the floor had sunk into the earth. They called it Casa Nostra, and in this secret house they would spread a blanket and lie embracing and talking. All their lovers' talk began with the phrase, After the war, after the war, when we are married, let's go to America. I've got relatives in Chicago. After the war, we won't bring up our children with any religion. They can make their own minds up when they're older. After the war, we'll go all over Europe, and you can give concerts in hotels, and that's how we'll live. After the war, I'll love you. I'll love you forever after the war. It was during this period of happiness for Pelagia and the captain that Dr. Iannis was woken one night by a gentle tapping on his window. Puzzled, the doctor looked out and saw a villager accompanied by a very tall, fair-haired man wearing the Greek national costume, something that a wealthy man might wear once a year on a feast day. We thought you were the man to help him, the villager told the doctor before departing. The tall stranger smiled and held out his hand, speaking in an extraordinarily old-fashioned Greek that the doctor found almost impossible to understand. The stranger then climbed, uninvited, through the doctor's window into the house and took a huge radio out of his bag. Pelagia woke and came into her father's room, saw the stranger and put her hand over her mouth, wide-eyed with amazement. Who's this? she demanded of her father. How am I supposed to know? replied the doctor. He says he's called Banios, and he talks Greek like a Spanish cow. The stranger bowed politely and shook Pelagia's hand, then smiled charmingly and said, Greek of the old days, Homer. Ancient Greek? exclaimed Pelagia disbelievingly. The doctor tapped his finger to his forehead. English? he asked. English, agreed the man. But I must beg you. Of course, we won't tell anyone. The man smiled. It had been an awful burden to speak the finest ancient Greek and not be understood. We are having an Italian officer sleeping in a room, said the doctor, whose English was not as good as he liked to believe. So we are being very quiet, please. Are you a spy? The man nodded and asked, Do you have any clothes I could have? I would be so grateful. The Englishman departed for the town of Argostoli at dawn, wearing trousers that ended halfway down his legs and having received some good advice from the doctor. Look, okay, you accent terrible, terrible. Not to talk, 
Understand? You are quiet until you learning. Also, you watch out communists. They thieves. Italians okay. Germans not good. See? Bunnius, whose real name was Bunny Warren, soon found an empty hut in the hills where, using his huge radio, he reported in great detail to his British masters, informing them of troop movements in the area. He also set himself the task of learning modern Greek, and was assisted in this by the willing islanders. The captain's opera group, La Scala, became accustomed to meeting in the doctor's house. Your soldiers are stealing from people's vegetable patches when we're dying of hunger already, said the doctor to Corelli one day, when the group was there. If it's true, they will be punished, the captain replied, already deeply shamed and embarrassed by the fact that some nights previously, someone, obviously an Italian soldier, had stolen Pelagia's goat. We Germans do not do this, said Gunther Weber, with a pleased expression on his face. Germans can't sing, replied Corelli, and anyway, I'll get this investigated and I'll put a stop to it. It's too bad. Weber smiled. You are very famous for defending the rights of the Greeks. I wonder if sometimes you understand why you are here. I try to think of it as a holiday. I don't have your advantages, Gunther. Advantages? Yes. I don't have the advantage of thinking that other races are inferior to mine. It's a question of science, said Weber. You can't alter a scientific fact. Corelli frowned. Science? I don't care about science. Moral principles are important, not science. We disagree, said Weber in a friendly fashion. Science tells us that the strong survive. Strength needs no excuses and doesn't have to give reasons. Science is about facts and morality is about values, said Carlo, who had been listening closely. It's also a matter of being able to live with yourself, Corelli added. You are a good man, said Gunther. I admit it. Why don't I get my record player from my car, and we can all sing with Marlene Dietrich? He went to his car and proudly returned with the record player, which he put down on the table. He put on the record, and Dietrich began to sing, her voice full of the sadness of knowledge, the longing for love. Oh, exclaimed Weber, her voice makes me melt. And Corelli said, Antonia likes this. She's going to sing. He began to accompany the song, playing so beautifully that in the village people stopped what they were doing and listened to Corelli fill the night. Pelagia left the kitchen, her form ghost-like in the light of the candles. Please, play that song again, she asked Weber. It was so beautiful. Do you like it? asked Weber, and she nodded. All right, he continued. When I go home after the war, I'll leave it with you. It would please me very much for you to have it. Pelagia was delighted. She looked at the smiling boy with his smart uniform and blonde hair, and was filled with pleasure. You're so sweet, she said, and kissed him naturally on the cheek so that the boys of La Scala cheered, and Weber went red, and hid his eyes with his hand. The time came when the doctor decided that it was necessary to discuss certain matters with Pelagia. There's something I have to talk to you about, he told her. It has not escaped my notice that you have fallen in love with the captain. She went violently red, and looked terribly shocked. The captain, she said foolishly. He began a long speech. It's not that I don't like the captain. Of course, he's a little mad, which is quite simply explained by the fact that he is Italian. In fact, I like him very much. 
But you must remember that you are engaged to Mandras, and technically, the captain is an enemy. Can you imagine the pain you will suffer when people discover that you have given up the love of a Greek in favor of an invader? People will throw stones at you and spit. You know that, don't you? You would have to move away to Italy if you wanted to stay with him, because here you might not be safe. Are you prepared to leave this island and this people? And another thing, love is a temporary madness. When it ends, you have to work out whether your roots have so joined together that it is unimaginable that you should ever separate. Because that is what love is. Love isn't breathlessness. It is not excitement. It is not lying awake at night, imagining that he is kissing every part of your body. No, don't look so embarrassed. I'm telling you some truths. That is just being in love, which any fool can do. Love itself is what is left over when being in love has burned away. I say to you that to marry the captain is impossible until our country is free again. I would be happy for you to do this, but this means that you have a love that will be delayed. Pelagia, you know as well as I do that love delayed means that physical passion increases. No, don't look at me like that. Do you think I don't know that young girls can be eaten by desire? Imagine if you got pregnant, what would you do? I would not assist in the murder of an innocent. Would you have the child, and then find that no man would ever marry you? I would not abandon you as long as I live, even under such circumstances. But imagine if I should die. What then? Pelagia had never felt so crushed in all her life, and wept bitterly. But when she looked up, she found her father looking at her sympathetically. You make everything sound so disgusting, she said. You don't know how it is. I went through a lot of this with your mother, he replied. She was engaged to someone else. I do know how it is. You don't forbid everything then? She asked hopefully. No, I don't forbid everything. I say you must be careful and act honorably to Mandras. Don't give in to your desires, that's all. The captain is a good man. Pray for our freedom, Pelagia, because then everything becomes possible. Pelagia stood up to go, and her father said, I did not intend to upset you. I was young once. Not everything was different in your day, then she said as she left the room, and her father smiled, pleased that his words had not crushed his daughter's spirit. The doctor and the captain were sitting indoors at the kitchen table while the latter was removing a broken string from his mandolin. The doctor leaned back and sighed, then suddenly asked, Are you and Pelagia planning to be married? As her father, I think I have a right to know. The captain was so surprised by the frankness of the question that he was unable to think of a reply. His relationship with Pelagia had only been able to proceed on the basis that no one ever brought the issue out into the open. He looked at the doctor anxiously. You can't live here, said the doctor. He pointed to the mandolin. If you want to be a musician, this is the last place to be. And I don't think that Pelagia could live in Italy. She is a Greek. She would die like a flower without sunlight. Ah, said the captain, for the lack of any intelligent remark. It's true, said the doctor. I know you have not thought about it. Italians always act without thinking. Anyway... Pelagia is a Greek. That's my point. So, can it work? There was a silence between the two men. I love her, said Corelli at last, as if this were the answer to the problem, which to him it was. 
I know that. You'd have to live here, that's all, said the doctor. You might have to choose between loving her and becoming a musician. The doctor left the room, more for dramatic effect than for any other purpose, and then came back in. And another thing. This is a very ancient land, and we've had nothing except murder for two thousand years. We've got so many places full of bitter ghosts that anyone who goes near them or lives in them becomes heartless or insane. I don't believe in God, Captain, but I do believe in ghosts, and there will be many more deaths. It's only a question of time, so don't make any plans. Chapter 9 Autumn 1943 Betrayal The Allies invaded Sicily, Italy's southern island, and so they betrayed their most loyal and courageous friend, Greece, and did not come to its aid. The angry Greeks demanded to know why their country, which was occupied by the Italians, had been ignored and received no answers. The Allies had abandoned Greece, the little nation that had given Europe its culture and its heart. To make matters worse, during this period, the Greek communists were committing unimaginably vicious acts, but for a long time the world did not believe it. On Kefalonia, the Italian soldiers listened to their radios and followed the course of Allied progress up Italy, their homeland, while the German soldiers were angered and disgusted by the Italian army's lack of resistance to the Allies. Corelli and his brother officers sensed ice in the air, and visits between the Germans and the Italians became less frequent. When Weber turned up at meetings of La Scala, he seemed quiet and distant. What happens, Corelli asked Pelagier with a troubled look, when we have to surrender before the Germans do? We'll get married. He shook his head sadly. It's going to be a complete mess. There's no chance of the British coming. They're going straight for Rome. No one will save us unless we save ourselves. We should attack the Germans on the island now, while there aren't many of them. But our generals don't do anything. They say we should trust the Germans. Don't you trust them? I'm not stupid. Come inside, she said. My father's out. There's no point. My mind is just a blank that's filled with worry. Corelli came to the doctor's house less often, and day and night he trained his men, working them hard in the terrible August heat, so that the sweat ran down their faces and arms, and the sun burned the flesh of their shoulders. They did not complain. They knew that the captain was right to prepare them. He himself stopped playing the mandolin. There was so little time for it that when he picked it up, it felt foreign in his fingers in comparison with a gun. He went home to Pelagia on his motorbike at times when her father was likely to be out, and he brought her bread, honey, bottles of wine, a photograph signed on the back with the words, After the War, written on it in his elegant, foreign-looking handwriting, and he brought her his tired, grey face and his saddened eyes. My poor darling, she would say, her arms about his neck, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. And he would move back a little and say, Corizimo, let me just look at you. And then came the time when Carlo was listening to the radio, trying to find a signal. It was the 8th of September, and the evenings had become much cooler than they had been before. Carlo had recently been thinking about Francesco, and about the horror of Albania. And now, more than ever, he knew that it had all been a waste, and that his time in Kefalonia 
had been a holiday from a war that was going to destroy his life once more, perhaps forever. He found a voice and turned up the volume. All aggressive acts by Italian armed forces against the forces of the British and the Americans will cease at once, everywhere. The Italians had formally surrendered to the Allies. Outside, the bells of the island began to ring. They rang all over the island in the towns of Argostoli, Lixuri, Sulari, Torizzata. On the radio, there was a message from Eisenhower, the American president. All Italians who take steps to rid themselves of the German presence in their country will have the assistance and support of the Allies. Carlo ran out and found Corelli just arriving on his bike, a great cloud of blue smoke behind him. Antonio! Antonio! It's all over! and the Allies have promised to help us, he cried. He threw his enormous arms around the man he loved and picked him up, dancing in a circle. Carlo, Carlo, the captain cried. Put me down. Don't get so excited. The Allies don't care about us. We're in Greece, remember? Carlo, you don't know your own strength. You half killed me. They'll help us, said Carlo, but Corelli shook his head. If we don't act now, we're finished. We've got to get the Germans on the island to surrender to us. That night, the Italian warships in the harbours of the island sailed for home, without informing anyone they were going, or taking with them a single Italian soldier. In a terrible act of cowardice, the warships withdrew their protection from the soldiers on the island, so that the German soldiers laughed, and Corelli's men smelled betrayal. Corelli waited at the telephone for orders, and when none came, he fell asleep in his chair. Carlo, now realizing that Corelli's pessimistic predictions were probably correct, wrote his captain a long letter in which he declared his undying love for him and also his unselfish hope that Corelli would find true happiness with Pelagia. Strangely convinced that he was going to die soon, Carlo added this letter to his other writings and brought them to the doctor's house, with the request that his papers should be placed in the hiding hole under the trap door and only opened and read in the event of his death. Like Corelli, Gunther Weber also slept from time to time in his chair, waiting for orders, desperately tired, and with all his confidence gone. He missed his Italian friends, but worse than that, his country was losing, and he no longer felt proud and full of strength. He felt inferior, and so betrayed by his country's allies, the Italians, that if he had been a woman, he would have wept. He tried to pray, but the words turned bitter in his mouth. Corelli stopped his motorcycle on his way back to camp, and beneath the shade of a tree, by a ruined wall, he sat and thought about going back to Italy, about surviving, about Pelagia. The truth was that he had no home, and that was why he never talked about it. Mussolini had forced his family to move to Libya, and there they had been attacked by rebels and had died, while he lay in hospital with a high fever. Of all the relatives' houses where he had stayed, which one was home? He had no family except his soldiers and his mandolin, and his heart was there in Greece. Had he suffered so much pain, so much loneliness, had he finally found a place to be, only to have it torn away? His memories of his parents were as thin and indefinite as those of a ghost, and for the first time he began to feel as if Pelagia already belonged to his past. He thought about dying, and wondered how long Pelagia would weep, and what a shame it would be to spoil her lovely flesh with tears. 
it broke his heart to imagine it. He wanted to reach out from beyond the grave and comfort her, even though he was not yet dead. He went to the doctor's house and asked them to look after his mandolin, and Pelagia wrapped it in a blanket and put it under the hole in the floor. They told him about Carlo's visit and how he had left a thick pile of papers with them. The captain had not known that Carlo had ambitions to be a writer and was curious about the content of the big man's papers. He thought that Pelagia looked very thin and almost ill, and when she sadly stroked his cheek, he almost did not know how to prevent his tears. After Italy's surrender to the Allies, General Gandin, leader of the Italian troops on Kefalonia, suffered terrible indecision about the course of action he should take. He had two choices. Compared to the number of Italian soldiers on the island, there were many fewer German troops, and he could insist that the German soldiers laid down their arms and surrendered to the superior Italian forces. If the Germans rejected this, then the Italian troops could, theoretically, attack and overcome them. But Gandhi knew that he would receive no support from the Allies, and, moreover, that he would have neither air nor sea support from his own country. He knew that the Germans still had a large number of bomber planes based in mainland Greece, and the thought of those death machines screaming over the island as they dropped their bombs filled him with horror. These thoughts led the general to the second option, which was to surrender to the Germans, on condition that the latter gave written guarantees of the safety of the Italian soldiers on the island. This would mean trusting the Germans not to break their promises and attack the Italians. It was this second route that Gandin was tempted to take. He was, in a strange way, a man of honour, and still considered the Germans to be his allies. Unlike General Gandin, the Italian troops on Kefalonia knew exactly what should be done. They heard from the radio that the Germans, as they withdrew in Italy, were killing and looting along the way, and they could see no reason why the Germans would not do the same in Kefalonia, given the chance. While Gandin delayed, unable to make up his mind, and his soldiers became almost crazy with anger and fear, the Germans quietly flew more arms and troops to the island. Finally, General Gandin came to a decision. Despite the universal demand of his men that the Germans should be forced to surrender, the general agreed with the German leaders on the island that the Italians should be allowed to keep their weapons and peacefully leave Kefalonia. There were no ships, however, to take the Italians away, a point which did not seem significant to Gandin. Some of the Italian troops, guessing what was likely to happen, became deeply depressed, while others, like Corelli, developed an iron determination and prepared their men to the last degree for the terrible battle that they were certain lay ahead of them. When the German bomber planes arrived, early in the afternoon, tipping their wings, it was almost a relief to the waiting Italians. Now everything was clear. It was at last obvious that the Germans had betrayed them, and that every Italian soldier would have to fight for his life. Gunther Weber knew that he would have to turn his weapons on his friends. Corelli knew that his musician's fingers, so well accustomed to the arts of peace, must now tighten around a gun. General Gandin knew too late that he had made the wrong decision and that, as a result, his men were going to die. Pelagia knew that a war that had always been somewhere else would now settle upon her home and turn its stones to dust. The German planes attacked Argostoli first 
because that was where most Italian troops were concentrated. Gandin made the foolish mistake of bringing his troops into the town in increasing numbers, and this made it easier for the Germans to isolate and cut them down. Houses were crushed by the bombs, and soldiers and islanders died in large numbers. More and more German soldiers were flown in and spread all over the island, killing as they went. Everyone knew that no ships or planes would come to aid an island of Kefalonia's insignificance. On a hillside, Bonnie Warren sat by his radio and tried to persuade his superiors that they should provide the Italians with air and sea support, but without success. Dr. Iannis and his daughter sat side by side at their kitchen table, unable to sleep, holding each other's hands. Pelagia was weeping. The doctor wanted to relight his pipe, but out of respect for his daughter's feelings, he allowed his hands to stay in hers, and he repeated, Corizimo, I am sure he is all right. But we haven't seen him for days, she cried. I just know he's dead. If he was dead, someone would have told us. Someone from La Scala. They were all nice boys. They would let us know. Were? she repeated. You think they're all dead? You think they're dead too, don't you? Oh, God, the doctor sighed. It was on the morning of the 22nd of September that Captain Antonio Corelli, knowing that his leaders were planning to surrender to the Germans, having had no sleep for three days, climbed on his motorcycle and sped towards Pelagia's house. He threw himself into her arms, resting his burning eyes upon her shoulder, and told her, We are lost. The British have betrayed us. She begged him to stay to hide in the house, in the hole in the floor, with his mandolin and Carlo's papers. But he took her face in his hands, kissed her without the tears that he was too tired to weep, and then rocked her in his arms, squeezing her so tightly that she thought that her bones would crack. He kissed her again and said, Corizimo, this is the last time I shall ever see you. There has been no honor in this war, but I have to be with my boys. With his head hanging down, he told her, Corizimo, I am going to die. Remember me to your father, and I thank God I have lived long enough to love you. She watched him go as he drove away on his motorcycle, the dust clouds surrounding his head, then she went inside and sat at the kitchen table, terror gripping her heart. Chapter 10 The Order to Kill Gunther Weber stood before his superior officer and, his face hard with determination, said, Sir, I must request that you give this task to someone else. I cannot carry it out. His superior raised an eyebrow, but somehow failed to feel any anger. The truth was that, in this position, he hoped that he would have done the same. Why not? he asked. Sir, it is against international law to murder prisoners of war. It is also wrong. I must request to be excused. They have betrayed us, their allies. I realize that, but I am not a criminal, sir, and I do not wish to become one. The officer sighed. War is a dirty business, you know that. We all have to do terrible things. For example, I like you, and I admire you for taking this position, but I must remind you that the punishment for refusing to obey an order is death. I don't state this as a threat, but as a fact of life. You know this as well as I do. 
He walked to the window and then turned. They're all going to be shot anyway. Why add your death to theirs? It would be a waste of a fine officer. Gunter Weber swallowed hard, and his lips trembled, so that he found it hard to speak. At last he said, I request that my protest is recorded and put in my file, sir. Your request is granted, said the officer, and left the room. Weber leaned against the wall and lit a cigarette, but his hand shook so much that he immediately dropped it. Let's sing, boys, said Antonio Corelli, looking round the inside of the truck where his men sat, watched by expressionist German soldiers. One of the Italians was already tearful. Others were praying, their heads bowed down to their knees. Corelli felt strangely happy, as if he were drunk with tiredness and the absolute certainty of death. Why not smile in the face of death? Let's sing, boys, he repeated. Carlo, sing. Carlo gazed at him with eyes full of endless sorrow and began very softly to sing a song from an opera they all loved, Madame Butterfly. And soon others joined in when they felt able to. The tune comforted them, and it was easier to sing than to think on death. It gave the heart something to do. When the truck arrived, Gunter Weber's knees began to shake. Almost before it had arrived, it seemed that he had known that life had called him to the killing of his friends. He had not expected them to arrive singing the tune that he and La Scala had sung together late at night at the doctor's house. Nor had he expected them to jump so lightly from the truck. He ordered a German soldier to put his friends against the wall, lit another cigarette, and turned away. But finally he turned again and approached the Italians. More than half of them were praying, kneeling in the soil, and others wept like children at a death. Antonio Corelli and Carlo Guerchio were embracing. Weber reached for his packet of cigarettes and approached them. Cigarette? he asked them, and Corelli took one, Carlo refusing. Corelli looked at Weber and said, Your hands are trembling, and your legs. Antonio, I am very sorry. I tried. Corelli sucked on his cigarette and said, I am sure you did, Gunther. I know how it goes. Weber's face trembled with the effort of hiding his tears, and at last he said suddenly, Forgive me. Carlo made a sound of disgust in his throat and said, You will never be forgiven. But Corelli put his hand up to silence his friend and said quietly, Gunther, I forgive you. If I do not, who will? Weber held out his hand. Goodbye, Gunther, said Corelli, taking it. Allowing his hand to remain in his former friends, he shook it briefly one final time and released it. He linked an arm through Carlo's and smiled up at him. Come, he said. We two have been companions in life. Let's go together to heaven. It was a beautiful day to die. A few soft clouds hit the top of Mount Enos, and nearby a goat bell rang. Corelli realized that his own legs were shaking, and that he could do nothing to prevent it. He thought about Pelagia, with her dark eyes, her passionate nature, her black hair. He saw her clearly in his mind's eye, making a blanket that grew smaller every day, arm in arm with her father, returning from the sea, kissing Gunter Weber on the cheek at the offer of the record player. Pelagia, whose form had been so sweetly rounded, now so pale and thin. 
A Croatian soldier approached Weber, a man who, in Weber's opinion, had a dangerously violent nature. The Croatian said, Sir, more will be arriving. We can't delay. Very well, said Weber. He closed his eyes and prayed, a prayer without words to a god who did not care. There was nothing formal about the killings, and the victims were not lined up against the wall or made to face forwards. Many of them were left on their knees, praying or weeping or begging for mercy. Some stood smoking, as if at a party, and Carlo stood next to Corelli, glad to die at last and determined to die a soldier's death. Corelli put one hand in his pocket to steady the shaking of his leg and deeply breathed the Cephalonian air that held Palagia's breath. The German boys heard the command to fire and fired in disbelief. Those of them whose eyes were open aimed wide or high or aimed to avoid a death. The Croatian soldier shot to kill, firing rapidly and taking careful aim. Weber's head spun. His former friends were leaping and dancing in the rain of bullets, were crying out, stumbling to their knees, arms waving, their mouths filled with blood. But what no one had seen, even Weber, was that at the order to fire, Carlo had stepped quickly sideways in front of Corelli, and had gripped the latter's wrists so tightly that he was unable to move. Corelli stared wonderingly into the middle of Carlo's back, as great holes burst through from inside the latter's body, releasing fountains of blood. Carlo stood unbroken as one bullet after another entered his chest like white-hot knives. He stood perfectly still and counted to thirty, looked up at the sky, and then threw himself over backwards. Corelli lay beneath him, unable to move, so astonished by this extraordinary, saintly act of love that he did not hear the Croatian soldier's voice. Italians, it's all over. If any of you are living, stand up now, and you will go free. He did not see the two or three stand up, and see them fall again as the Croatian shot them down. Then he heard the single shots as Weber, drunk with horror, wandered among the dead, putting those still living out of their pain. Next to his head he saw Weber's boot, and he saw Weber bend down and look directly into his eyes where he lay trapped beneath Carlo's great weight. He saw the shaking gun approach his face. He saw the ocean of sorrow in Weber's eyes. And then he saw the gun withdrawn, unfired. He tried to breathe more freely and realized he was having difficulty, not only because of Carlo's weight, but because the bullets that had passed through his friend had also struck himself. Corelli lay beneath his friend for hours, their blood mixing in the soil, in their uniforms, in their flesh. It was not until evening that Velisarius came across the heap of tragic bodies and recognized the man as big as himself, who had once reached a hand across the barrier of war and offered him a cigarette. He looked down into the vacant and staring eyes, reached down and tried to close them. He failed and was struck by the horror of leaving such a brother to the wind and birds. He knelt down and with a huge effort he lifted Carlo from the ground and, as he did so, he saw the mad captain who was staying at the doctor's, the one whose secret love for Pelagia was known and discussed by everyone on the island. The man's eyes were not vacant, and they blinked. The lips moved. 
Doctor, said the dying man. Pelagia. The strong man put Carlo against the wall. Then he carefully picked the captain up, felt how light he was, and set off across the stony fields to save his life. Nobody knows the exact number of the Italian dead that lay upon the earth of Cephalonia, but at least four thousand were murdered, possibly nine thousand. The evidence was lost in flame, because the Germans, displaying knowledge of their guilt, burnt the bodies, cutting down trees that were a thousand years old to make the fires. They changed flesh into smoke. They put one dead boy after another across their shoulders and tipped them into the flames, working until their legs weakened and the flames became too hot to approach. One of the bodies that they burned was the body of General Gandin, who trusted his enemies and tried to save his men. Another who died at this time was Father Asinius, the priest from Pelagia's village. He wandered among the bodies and the flames until he was so mad with grief that he began to beat the heads and shoulders of the German soldiers with a stick. At first, the soldiers, who had murdered thousands, did not know what to do. But then an officer came up behind Arsenius and fired a single shot into the back of his neck, exploding his brains. Men and women and the few Italian soldiers who had escaped approached the fires as closely as the heat permitted and began to pull away the bodies at the edge of the fires. All of them thought the same things. Is this what it will be like under the Germans? How many of these boys could there have been? How many of these boys did I know? Can I imagine how it is to die of bleeding? Slowly, at dawn, a thick black cloud hung over the land and blocked out the sun, and the people returned to their houses and locked their doors. Chapter 11 An Operation When the door was suddenly kicked open, just as it was getting dark, Pelagia's first thought was that it was the Germans, since she knew that all the Italians were dead. Like everybody else, she had heard the sounds of battle and seen truck after truck pass by, bearing either cheering German soldiers or the dead bodies of Italians. At night, she had gone out with her father, whose cheeks were trembling with tears of anger and pity, and looked for lives to save among those bodies abandoned in the fires. It had left her speechless, not with fear or sorrow, but with emptiness. When the door flew open, she was frightened, but she had nevertheless somehow been expecting it. Her gun was ready in her pocket. She stood up, her hand tightening around the gun, her face colourless, and saw Velisarius, breathing hard. He advanced to the table and gently placed his burden on it. Who is it? asked Pelagia. He's alive, said Velisarius. It's the mad captain. She bent down to look with eyes full of both horror and hope, but she did not recognise him. There were too many holes, too much blood. She wanted to touch him, but withdrew her hand. Where does one touch a man like this? The body opened its eyes, and the mouth smiled. Calimera Corizimo, it said, and she recognized the voice. It's the evening, she said foolishly. Calispera, then, he whispered, and closed his eyes. Pelagia looked up at Velisarius, her eyes wide and desperate, and said, Velisarius, you have never done a greater thing. 
I'm going to get my father. Stay with him. She found her father at the Café Neon and dragged him out, ignoring the angry stares of the other men, and Cocolius, who roared at her. The doctor looked at the body and knew he had never seen anything worse. There was enough blood to fill the veins of a horse. It would be kinder to kill him, he said. But before Verisarius could say, I thought so too, Pelagia began beating her father with both hands. And so water was put on to boil, and the rags of the captain's uniform were gently cut away. Dr. Iannis complained as he cleaned away the blood. What am I supposed to do? I have no equipment to perform an operation. Shut up, shut up, shut up, Pelagia shouted, her heart racing with both fear and determination. Just shut up and do it. Because the doctor was unaware that most of the blood and flesh had belonged to the broad back of Carlo Guercio, it seemed unbelievable to him that Antonio Corelli was as little wounded as he was. Once he was cleaned, it was clear that the victim had six bullets in his chest, one in the stomach and one through the outer flesh in his right arm. But the doctor knew too much to be optimistic, and it still seemed hopeless. Frightened of the task that lay ahead of him, he opened a bottle of raki, drank deeply, and passed the bottle to Velisarius, who did the same. Then, with the comforting taste of alcohol in his mouth, he reached for an instrument and moved it gently around in each wound until he felt it reach a bullet. He stood up amazed, realizing that the holes were not even deep and that the bullets should have passed right through the victim's body, but had not done so. Daughter, he said, I swear by all the saints that this man's flesh is made of steel. I think he'll live. Antonio, he called, and Corelli opened his eyes. Antonio, I'm going to operate. I haven't got much morphia. Can you drink? Corelli nodded and Pelagia poured a cup of raki down his throat while the doctor injected morphia into his arm. Pelagia looked at that desperately damaged body, helpless as a worm, and knew that it was not exactly a body that one loved, but that one loved the man who shone out through the eyes and used his mouth to smile and speak. The doctor saw her dreaming and said, don't just sit there. We need more boiling water. And wash your hands, especially under the nails. Pelagia discovered in that hour how difficult the task was that she had set her father. Her hands trembled, and at first she could hardly force herself to touch the captain. She looked up and saw her father cutting wide holes around the bullet wounds, and had to resist her desire to be sick. The doctor started on the bullet in the stomach, since he needed to do something that was relatively easy in order to increase his confidence. He found it, not far beneath the surface of the skin, and picked it out, amazed by its flattened shape. It's unbelievable, he said, showing it to Pelagia. How do you explain this? He was behind that big man, the one as big as me, said Velisarius. The big man was holding him from behind, like this. He stood up and put his hands behind his back to show how one could grip another's wrists. I think he was trying to save the man, he said. Carlo said Pelagia, suddenly bursting into tears. Carlo was the first of the boys of La Scala, whom they now knew with certainty was dead. No man who dies like that has died for nothing, said the doctor, fighting back his own need for tears. 
Caligia wiped her eyes on the sleeve of her dress and said, Antonio always said that Carlo was the bravest in the army. Velisarius, is the man's body still there? We would like to bury it and not see it burned, said the doctor. It's after dark. I'll go and look, said the strong man. On the way, I might kill a German. Who knows? He departed, happy to be out of that house where the sights were enough to make one ill. When the doctor had finished cleaning out the wound, he gave Pelagia the task of sewing it up, and she did so with accuracy and care, despite her feeling of the unreality of it all. Velisarius buried Carlo Guercio's remains that night in the yard of the doctor's house. Just before dawn, when the operation on the captain was finished at last, and father and daughter were both utterly exhausted, they came out to say their goodbye to that heroic soldier. Pelagia combed the hair and kissed the forehead, and Velisarius placed a cigarette in the dead man's lips. I owed him one, he said. The doctor made a speech while Pelagia wept beside him. Sleep long and well, he ended. As long as we remember you, you will be remembered fair and young. Leaning upon each other, the doctor and his daughter returned inside. Carefully, they carried Corelli to Pelagia's bed, and outside, the first bird sang. It was only a short time before the Germans began to take an interest in loot. Not only did the doctor have to hide his valuables, he also had to hide an Italian officer who lay, unable to move, in his daughter's bed. Pelagia made a bed for him at the bottom of the hole in the kitchen, and once again Velisarius was called in to carry him. There Corelli was reunited with his mandolin, and Carlo's papers were temporarily removed. The lid of the hiding place was left open unless troops were in the neighborhood. For the first day after the operation, the captain slept, but when he first woke, the pain was so bad that he could not move at all, and he felt as if he had been run over by a lorry. I can't breathe, he told the doctor. If you couldn't breathe, you couldn't speak. The captain said nothing, and the doctor continued. It appears that Carlo saved your life. It doesn't appear. I know he did. Of all of us, he died the best. And he's left me to remember it. You shouldn't weep, Captain. We're going to get you well and then get you off the island. When I am better, you must move me from the house, Doctor. I don't want you in danger. If I am caught, I should die alone. We can move you to your secret house, where you used to go with Pelagia. Don't look so surprised. Everybody knew. And you may not get better. Remember that. My God, Doctor, please tell me some lies. The truth will make us free. We overcome fear by looking it in the eyes. The captain fell into a fever two days later, and Pelagia remained in the hiding place with him, wiping his forehead to reduce his temperature. The fever came to a crisis on the fourth day, and Corelli was sweating so much and talking so nonsensically that both the doctor and Pelagia feared for his life. But two days later, the fever left, and the patient opened his eyes with wonder, as if realizing that he existed for the first time. He felt weaker than it ought to be possible to feel, but by the same evening he was able to stand with the doctor's help and let himself be washed. Pelagia fetched a mirror and showed him his new grown beard, and that night he was fed his first solid meal.
snails. In later life, Pelagia remembered the time of Corelli's recovery and his escape not as a period of exciting adventure, nor even as a time of fear and hope, but as the slow beginning of her sorrows. The war had reduced her anyway. Her skin, stretched tightly over her bones, was transparent from lack of food, and when she ate, she chewed carefully in case she lost a tooth. Her rich black hair had thinned and lost its shine, and showed the first grey hairs that should not have appeared for at least another decade. It was hard to obtain food, and the doctor was reduced to trapping snakes and other such creatures. Things were not hopeless, however. There was always the sea, the source of Kefalonia's being. As soon as Corelli could walk, he went in the company of the doctor and Velisarius to Casa Nostra at night, while Pelagia remained at home in the hiding place in which the mandolin, the doctor's history, and Carlo's papers had been replaced. As long as the German rapists were on the island, she hardly left the house. Corelli had given her his ring, too big for any of her fingers, and she turned it round and round in the lamplight. The captain came frequently, after dark, complaining that the hut was cold, his new beard scratching her cheeks as they lay fully clothed upon her bed, wrapped in each other's embrace, talking of the future and the past. I will always hate the Germans, she said. Gunther saved my life. He murdered all your friends. He had no choice. It wouldn't surprise me if he shot himself afterwards. He was trying not to cry. There is always a choice. He wasn't brave like Carlo. Only one in a million is made like that. You mustn't blame poor Gunther. Pelagia desperately wanted to keep her captain on the island, but knew that she would kill him if she did. There were people who were prepared to betray for bread, and it could only be a matter of time before the Germans became aware of his presence in their lives. She asked Cocolius and Stamatis to inquire for news of Bunios, the English spy, and to tell him to call on her if he could. For some time now, Bunny Warren had been encouraging the owners of boats to help the few surviving Italian soldiers to escape from the island, and it was easy for him to arrange the captain's departure. He called at Pelagia's home one night, tapping softly on her window, and when she had removed herself from Corelli's embrace, she looked out and saw the man whose help she had both sought and feared. He came in through the door and very formally shook her hand. "'Who is this?' asked Corelli, who for a moment had been fearing a visit from the Germans. "'Banios,' said Pelagia, without answering his question. "'This is an Italian soldier, and we have to get him out.' By chance, a boat was leaving for Sicily the following morning, and it would be easy to put the captain on board. They simply had to go to a certain bay at one o'clock in the morning with a lamp and flash out to sea in answer to the signals flashed from the boat. Corelli did not go back to Casa Nostra before dawn, but stayed with Pelagia in the house. The three of them sat in that familiar kitchen, saddened and fearful, talking quietly and shaking their heads over all the memories. I owe my life to you, Doctor, the captain said. I'm sorry about the scars. It was the best I could do. And I am sorry, Doctor, about the rape of the island. I don't suppose we will ever be forgiven. As you know, Captain, I must have forgiven you, or I would not have given you permission to marry my daughter. Pelagia and Corelli looked at each other, and the captain said, We have decided that if we have a son, we will name him Iannis. 
The doctor was visibly delighted, even though this was exactly what he would have expected under the circumstances. He looked up, his eyes watering, and said simply, Antonio, if I have ever had a son, it was you. You have a place at this table. Corelli stood up, and the two men embraced, clapping each other on the back, and then the doctor embraced his daughter. I'll leave you two children together, he said. There is a little girl dying, and I should visit. The doctor left the house, and the two lovers sat opposite each other, unable to speak. Finally, the tears began to follow each other slowly down Pelagia's cheeks, and Corelli knelt beside her, put his arms around her, and laid his head against her chest. He was shocked again at how thin she was, and closed his eyes tightly, imagining that it was another world. I am so afraid, she said. I think you won't come back, and the war goes on and on forever, and there's no safety and no hope, and I'll be left with nothing. I shall not forget you, and I will come back, replied Corelli. Promise? I promise. I have left you my ring and Antonia. We never read Carlo's papers. Too painful. We'll read them when I return. She stroked his hair in silence and said finally, Antonio, I wish that we had lain together as a man and woman. Everything at the right time, Corizimo. There may not be a time. There will be. You have my promise. At eleven o'clock, Bunny Warren scratched at the window. He carried a knife in his belt and sounded extremely efficient as he gave detailed instructions to the doctor, who translated them for Corelli's benefit. It was a cold December night. There was no moon, and since most Germans preferred to be indoors on such a night, the journey to the beach was relatively safe. Nevertheless, Pelagia's heart beat fast, and a dark hole seemed to be opening in her heart. Corelli felt so sad, he almost wished that they would meet some German soldiers so that he could die, fighting and killing, and end it all. He knew that to leave the island would be to lose his roots. For warmth, the four of them stood close together on the tiny patch of sand, waiting for the flash of a lamp that would come to them from the sea. Corelli walked to the waterline and, seeing the black waves, wondered how he would ever survive the journey. He felt his love for the island turning in his chest like the twist of a knife, because he had his own village now, and even his thought and speech had changed. Returning to Pelagia, he held her face in his hands, and then embraced her. When the light flashed three times from the sea, and Warren returned the signal, Corelli shook his hand, kissed his father-in-law on both cheeks, and went to Pelagia once more. There was nothing to be said. He knew that her mouth was trembling with grief, and his throat was tight with the same emotion. He stroked her cheek tenderly, and kissed her eyes. He heard the sound of the boat approaching, and looked up to see the shadows of two men inside it. The four approached the boat, and the doctor said, Go well, Antonio, and return. May God hear you, said the captain, and for the last time he held Pelagia. After he had climbed into the boat, Disappearing into the darkness like a ghost, Pelagia ran into the waves until the sea reached her thighs, but though she tried to catch sight of him, she saw nothing. A terrible emptiness seized her, and she put her hands to her face and wept, bent over in pain, her cries carried off in the wind, 
and were lost in the sound of the sea.